but it's not a difficult system. Crossing our fingers. Thank you all for coming and for caring. Nobody would be here if they didn't care, right? Birthday events here. So, uh, yeah, so related to, you know, coming into the uh, fourth grade classrooms all through uh, Mason County uh, a week and a half ago now, uh, there is uh, an environmental group. It's actually a uh, Straits Area Audubon Society uh, out of Sheboygan, so not, not too far south of the bridge, that in 2009, some members of, of uh, uh, Straits Area Audubon saw me doing a Michigan Snakes Alive presentation. And anybody been to uh, Whitefish Point at the end of April has something that's called Spring Fling Birding Event uh, at the end of April that's worth going to if anybody hasn't been to that. Lots of hawks migrating through uh, that time of the spring. Just I think it would be next weekend then. You can look that up. But they saw me giving a presentation there at that event. And this couple comes up to me and says, we need to have you do this presentation at Straits Area Audubon's meeting. And then the woman went farther and said, every school kid should get this presentation. Mm -hmm. And she said, if we start fundraising, will you come into schools up here, all the communities and all the way up in northern lower peninsula? I said, sure. And we hear stuff like that here and there from enthusiastic people every now and then. And you wonder, well, are we ever going to hear from them again? Well, a year later, her name is Kathy Bricker. She just passed away from uh, ovarian cancer a little over a year ago, as a matter of fact, now. But she calls me and says, I got the funding. I have been fundraising for a year. We have thousands of dollars, and we want you to go through all of these schools, fifth graders, they came fifth grade. That was in 2009. I have been going up there every year doing fifth grade, fifth grade, in pretty much every school from Petoskey over to the east side of the state, out of way, Rogers City and everything up that way since 2009, except for two years that we missed because mm -hmm. of COVID. And wow, all of those fifth graders are going to, this makes me feel good, chokes me up really sometimes, that all those fifth graders are going to grow into adults who are not out there afraid of snakes or killing snakes or destroying <laughs> snake habitat because they recognize them out there in the environment around them and they value them instead of abhor them or fear them or something like that. And I'm hoping we can get that going here with fourth graders. Every fourth grader, if you're in fourth grade, you can look forward to uh, a Michigan Snakes Alive uh, program that will come in to your school. So uh, anyway, um, we're going to just go big right away. 
in here, there's probably close to 50 feet worth of snake in here. <laughs> I'm not kidding, they're all Michigan snakes. I'm not pulling out any big pythons or anything. All right, let's pull this one out first. Okay, uh, show of hands, how many of you are fourth graders here who saw the program a week and a half ago? All right. Don't spoil any of the presentation surprises. <laughs> uh, and so you're all knowledgeable. I hope I don't bore you. you you've been through all of this before. Okay, now, um, uh, so first of all, I just want to, to reiterate something that uh, Julia said, that, yeah, my wife and I built our own nature center onto our house. In fact, <laughs> bless her heart, she came on, joined me and my passion, I remember when we first started dating, and she's this young 20-year-old woman starting to date this guy. He likes nature. <laughs> he likes birds. He likes snakes. And uh, turn her around on that in a big way, and uh, like she loves and is into all of that. You know where she is right now? Up in Sheboygan, there's an Earth Day event. A lot of people from that Straits area Audubon, there's an Earth Day event there going on, and she has the whole collection of Michigan turtles uh, exhibited there, and nearly every species of Michigan frog has an exhibit format uh, through their, with their whole Earth Day event going on there today with with uh, one of my uh, with my daughter, and so uh, uh, we have accumulated what we call the state's largest zoo of Michigan native reptiles and amphibians at our big little nature center attached to our house. This is out north of Williamston. Anybody finds themselves going down in the direction of Lansing or something, uh, people visit by appointment. All you need to do is let us know, hey, are you somebody available to, to have a stop in for an hour or something on a particular day? And if one of us is available, we'll say, yep, come on over. We'd uh, be glad to have you, and you can do all of this stuff. All of just you and us together. Okay. So uh, anyway, when I uh, pull out a big snake like this in front of an audience for the first time, or even just a few handful of people, there is one question that we get asked over and over again. It is what I call the number one question that we know is coming before sometimes even you know you're gonna say it. That's how long we've been doing this. We know what you're gonna ask. Does anybody know? Well, fourth graders, give somebody else a chance. Does anybody know what the number one question might be? None of you are fourth graders? Okay, yes. What's the number one question? Is it dangerous? Uh, you're, it's not quite that, but you're getting close. Okay, yeah. What breeds, what kind of Uh, it's not that question, do you know? What's the number scary? one question? Is it scary? Is it scary? Oh, uh, that's not it. You might be scared. Yes. <laughs> you got it. It's the bite question in some form. Does it bite? Will it bite? Why is it biting? It's a snake. Snake's bite. Why is it biting? Why is it biting? <laughs> I don't know how this got started, but why do people stick bites together with snakes like they stick jelly with peanut butter? Why is that? In reality, yeah, well, there's part of it, right? Uh, um, in reality, a snake is no more likely to bite than any other animal. <coughs> a snake like this one, I watched this hatch out of an egg. This is our 12-year-old uh, female. I watched her hatch out of an egg. A snake that is not afraid of people is the gentlest creature you would ever meet. If any of you in here stop by our exhibit in the other room, JT and I are just, you know, relaxed, mingling around with a bunch of people handling snakes all over the place. And both he and I, who know snakes, know that there is no way ever that any of these snakes is ever going to bite somebody holding them. When a stranger 
well, it's one of my snakes. I am more concerned about the safety of the snake than that person. I know the person's going to be fine. I'm worried. Are they going to drop it or you know hurt it, squeeze it, hang it, or whatever? So this is kind of a funny little thing crossing into entertainment that I, I tell kids in schools. I was just doing this in a school uh, earlier this week. Is I tell the kids, my little he just turned four now. Yeah. My little grandson. When he's like three, three and a half years old, he comes over to Grandma and Grandma's house and he loves going down to the nature center and checking out the turtles and the frogs and the snakes. And he knows he gets to hold the snakes. And so he comes over and he's like, Grandpa, Grandpa, can I hold, can I hold a snake? Grandpa, can I hold a snake? And I say, sure. And this little dude only this big is handling this big six foot rat snake. And so I'll tell them, okay, open your hands, just like the fourth graders here, now how to handle the snake. You support the body and give the snake the freedom to move. And I'll go and try to take one of these big snakes. It's a constrictor, see? Uh, one of these big snakes, and I'll try to balance it in his little hands. And he's holding his hands out, just like I told him to. And I'm trying to put this big snake in these little hands, and it keeps spilling over the side of his hands. And then, if it's spilling over his hands, he just grabs it like this, you know. And uh, here it is. He's holding it all. So, whoop, now it's like this. And he is so proud of himself to be holding this big snake. And what does he do? He needs to show grandma. <laughs> So he's holding it, and all of a sudden it's like this, and he goes running out of the room. Grandma! Grandma! Hold it a snake! <laughs> and I have to chase him down. He runs out of the room, going to show Grandma. Look at me, I'm holding this thing up by their hand, and then they drop it. I know it's coming. I hear a shriek. I freak out for the safety of the snake. I got, that means I need to rush and rescue it. So any of you working there and exhibit, some of the fourth graders and other kids here would love to help us out, helping other people handle the snakes. You hear somebody scream, you are running to rescue the snake, not the person. You are running to rescue the snake. The snake is in trouble, the person's fine. You might be having a heart attack because of the snake. Okay. All right, so um, anyway, why would people be scared of snakes, especially uh, if they're afraid of bites. If they're afraid of the snake biting. Yeah, look at these hands going on. This is rhetorical, by the way. It's a rhetorical question, hands down. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, even though you might know. Okay, so a lot of people are afraid, oh, the snake's got fangs, the snake's got teeth, it's going to bite. Well, guess what? If you've got a mouth in your head, you, you, you can bite. Okay, and so the snake does have needle sharp teeth. But there, you can make this argument, it's certainly true. We've got over 3,000 species of snakes in the world. There is not a single one that is capable of killing its prey with its teeth. Snakes do not have killing teeth. It's even venom's ones. Well, it's the venom. It's not the teeth that are killing the prey, it's the venom, right? Don't be afraid of the teeth, be afraid of the venom. Okay. Uh, and so uh, we're going to talk about the different methods that snakes secure their prey. Okay, so uh, the uh, snakes have ripping teeth, not killing teeth. This is by far, in a way, the major function of snake teeth is to just rip their prey, not rip you. You're a you're a predator, potential predator coming after them. They need their gripping teeth to get their food secure their food. Okay, so what are snake teeth like? What are your teeth like? Fish hook barbs. The barb on a fish hook. Can a barb on a fish hook kill a fish? No. It can snag a fish, but it can't kill a fish. Okay, it'll, well, let's not get into that. Okay, the fish is this little big and the hook is this big, maybe, all right. But um, uh, anyway, the, uh, uh, these needle sharp teeth, are in rows on the roof of its mouth and on the bottom jaw in, a, in an arc, just like the teeth in our mouths. And so if you were to be bitten by one of these snakes that has these little needle tip teeth, all you're getting is like teeny tiny little fish hook barbs stuck in your skin. Now your reaction to a snake striking and maybe it getting its mouth on you is to pull back. These tiny little fish hook barb teeth are scraping through your skin. 
are you going to have to go, if a snake this big, Michigan's largest snake, that you, do you think you're going to have to go to the hospital or the doctor or the ready care? No. No, you know what? You go to the bathroom sink, you know, there might be a little bit of blood, a little skin wound, and wash it with soap and water. If you need a Band-Aid, fine, go ahead and put it on. I've never put a Band-Aid on one of my sick bites before, and they stop bleeding pretty soon and everything is fine. A couple of days later, I can't even tell where did I get bit, what finger was it, I, I can't even tell anymore. All right, that is the severity of Michigan's largest snake if you were to get bitten by one. Okay, so having told you that, I just want to let you know this snake is a constrictor. And when I introduce a snake as a constrictor, I'm not saying, hey, it's a boa constrictor. The boa constrictor has, happens to have its method for securing its prey and its name. I'm telling you this snake's method for securing its prey. We all know what a constrictor does to its prey, right? Does the wrap around, squeezes it, puts the squeeze on it, right? So constricting is one of three methods, three basic methods that all snakes in the world have to secure their prey. Securing it means from getting it from running around out there to going down their throats, okay? So if constricting, I'm gonna tell you right now, is the second most common way that snakes in the world secure their prey. I bet you there's some people in here who know at least one or both of the other ways that snakes secure their prey. Okay, do you know? Okay. Um, for securing their prey or killing their prey? Securing their prey. Um, the barbed teeth? Well, that's, they all have that. It doesn't matter what, what method they use to secure their prey, the first thing you have to do is get their mouths on it. That is number one with all of them. They need to get their mouth on it. They're about to eat it. They need to get their mouth on it. Okay? Yeah? Okay, some snakes inject venom into their prey, so it's yeah. easier to get them. All right, that's another one. Envenomating the prey. Giving it a shot of venom is another way that snakes in the world secure their prey. Now, constricting is the second most common way. Do you think envenomating the prey is the least common or the most common way snakes secure their prey? It is the least common by far. It's not even close. In fact, I want to tell you something. The second most common way constricting plus the least common way envenomating only makes up, those two together, only make up about 30% of all of the snake species in the world. Those two methods combined, which means another 70% secure this, their prey, this last third most common way. And you know what I find very interesting doing this over many decades, is it's the way that most people have a hard time coming up with, and it is the way, the thing you should think of first. This is like what man. Oh, okay. Uh, for now, sure, I think. We can use that educationally, just a little side by side. Okay, great. Um, okay, um, I'm trying to thought, get it back there. Oh yeah, Sorry. so grab and hold honors. So, um, do we have anybody here from AFFEW, a few who can help me with something? No? I'm, you know what, I, I uh, had to run in here late because our exhibit went so long. It would be nice if we could, oh, I see push pins up there. I want to hang this up. Yeah, do you mind? Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, I, there's all the snakes of Michigan. So some of you have posters of the snakes of Michigan. Most of you don't. And so I want to point out some of these here. So uh, the third way, the most common way that snakes in the world secure their prey is the way most people have a hard time coming up with, and it's what you should think of first. So. Some of them wrap around it, put their squeeze on it. Others give it a shot of venom to stop it. What is that third way? I want to pick on an adult. There's a lot of kids' hands going up. I'm wondering any adults. Know this, okay. So, there is a key word I'm going to use that's pretty much going to sum it up. And that key word is alive. The vast majority of snakes in the world they have no way to kill their prey. So how do they eat it? Alive. Struggling alive. It's going down their throat. And if you actually saw one of these snakes, and it's just closing its mouth over something that's going down, I describe it as like, imagine a, a predatory sock. Okay. <laughs> a predatory stretchy sock. This is what it's like. Okay, and this thing is stretching over, let's say a garter snake eating a frog. 
something you might see in your backyard. That frog is going down the garter snake's throat, and the garter snake closes its mouth, and there goes the lump. You know what? If you pick up that garter snake, and that lump is sliding down towards its belly, and you pick that thing up, and you squeezed forward like a tube of toothpaste, when that frog out. comes back up to its mouth, that frog is hopping away. It's still alive. Okay? You just squeezed it out of the killer tube of toothpaste. Okay? So uh, that, is, that is the reality. And so let's look at those three uh, methods for securing prey with the Michigan snake. So there's 17 species of snakes in Michigan. Uh, here's the rat snake. The rat snake is one of three species that are constrictors. Rat snake, <coughs> fox snake, Eastern milk snake. These are the only three constrictors in Michigan. We only have one venomous snake, as a lot of you know, in the state of Michigan. One venomous snake. And sometimes I find people have a hard time pronouncing. And Michiganders take the shortcut and just call it the Michigan Rattler. I do not think they call it the Michigan Rattler in Wisconsin. I do not think they call it the Michigan Rattler in Indiana. It's the same species. Okay. Michigan Rattlesnake. Eastern Massasauga. 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 You have to say that a few times before you remember those four syllables. Massasauga. I hear some adults sometimes. I like to pick on adults, you're going to notice. I'm giving kids a break because they haven't been through all of their education yet. Well, neither have the adults, lifelong learners, everybody. Uh, but uh, uh, I like to tell people that I. I love for difficult words to put some kind of word handle to it. What can I think about that's going to make me remember Massasauga? And one day I thought to myself, you know, if you had a big pile of hot dogs, you could call it a Massa sausage. <laughs> for any of you who are good artists, I would like you to draw or paint or your, use the medium of your choice, I would like you to draw a funny picture of a massa sausage rattlesnake. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if you remember massa sausage, big pile of hot dogs, it's going to make you remember massa saga easier. You're just putting a gun instead of the sedge. And you got it. Okay. All right, so a little massasauga rattlesnake. Now, I don't have a massasauga rattlesnake with me. You might be a little bit disappointed or not, not. about that. I not. But I want to point something out about the massasauga right here. Do you see how stout body this snake is? It is a small snake. It actually belongs to uh, this uh, uh, genus of rattlesnakes that are called the pygmy rattlesnakes for good reason. These things are miniature rattlesnakes. And uh, so I did see this online. Hey, everybody, you can't believe everything you see on the internet. But they had one picture I saw that was going around. They, these people found the world's biggest Massasauga. And you know the trick about holding it at the camera like this, and the person is way back here and looking small, and they've got it, and they're holding it out like this in front of the camera, and it looks like the thing is nine feet long when it's maybe a foot and a half long. Or something like that. So don't be fooled by that. Do you see how tiny its head is? Yeah. yeah how tiny its head is in relation to its big fat body. The massasauga rattlesnake is the most stout bodied snake in Michigan, and it is slow moving. A massasauga rattlesnake can't dart anywhere. Garter snakes can dart pretty quickly. Anybody familiar with blue racers, they can really move when they're scared, startled, or something like that. Not this stout bodied one. In general, out in nature, Humans are otherwise. Stout bodied creatures don't move as fast as wiry bodied creatures. And it's true in the world of, of snakes, too. And so look at this. This little rattlesnake has a method to get big things that move around in the environment to keep their distance from it. And it's the rattle. So if you step too close to a massasauga rattlesnake, it's not going to bite you. It does not want to bite you. It needs its venom and to secure its prey. It doesn't all want to waste it on every big clunky mammal walking through its habitat. And so it's letting you know you who I'm here. 
Deer are walking through Massasauga habitat all the time. They're off trail, walking right through the overgrowth in a marshy habitat that a Massasauga might occupy. But I have never seen gimpy deer. I have been through areas that is great Massasauga habitat, and I'm seeing deer going by all over the place, and I don't see any limping deer. The Massasaugas aren't there. Oh, there goes a deer. <laughs> Whiten up and all these deer. Right? <laughs> you know, for the Massasauga habitat. Why? The deer are walking around, you know, just grazing, moving around randomly. One steps too close to a Massasauga, what does it do? Starts doing this with its tail. It sounds like a bee buzzing. And the deer hears that, probably doesn't even see it. The deer hears that, what does it do? Please. <laughs> no. You know, the deer hears that, and the deer just makes a wide berth around it or hops over it and keeps going. You got a uh, snake phobic he man walking through the habitat <laughs> and all of a sudden this little massasauga rattlesnake, they step too close to it, all of a sudden it starts buzzing. Rattlesnake! You know, and then they you know then they go and they kill it. By the way, the Massasauga is a state threatened snake. It is against the law to kill a Massasauga rattlesnake. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of witnesses out there to turn somebody in if they're out there and they happen to kill it. But good for everybody to know if you live next to a marshy habitat and one happens to come through your yard that this is a state protected snake. If you're worried about it, you can call you know, your local conservation officer, or DNR field officer, something, and they, they'll have some tips on what to do about that. Okay, so anyway, then we have the grab and hold honors. We only have one venomous snake. Uh, we have three constrictors, and 13 others in the state are just grabbing and hold on for the ride. They have no way to kill their prey. Okay. All right. So uh, I was really hoping JT would be would be back by now, but I want to ask you something. I know um, you were handling the rat snakes, right, at our uh, exhibit. Would you like to right now take the snake and walk around through the audience? and let people just see it up close. And if they want to touch or pet it, that's fine. So why don't you see if you can work your way through the audience in just like five minutes or so. You know, if anybody wants to take pictures, we can do that later. But just getting through. Now, I got to tell you something. What's your name? OK, so Tucker is going to walk around with this. Don't leave yet. I have one other thing to tell you. You need to, and we coached our kids when they were younger with this, don't leave yet. I'm still getting your direction. Okay. When you are walking around, there might be some people who are kind of nervous about snakes in the audience. And so you need to read facial expressions and body language. Okay. So if you see somebody like this, do you come closer? Okay. What if you see somebody like this? If somebody is like this in their seat, don't go, here, here, and they fall over backwards. Okay, so uh, that's what I'm talking about. And we coached our kids. Our, our kids are all adults now, but we have them. When my wife and I are doing these presentations, little, you know, little seven, eight-year-old that we're coaching them. Okay, if a person looks scared, don't go any closer. Just walk around them, uh, not wanting anybody to get up and jump up and run out of the room. Okay, are we good with that? You know what I'm going to tell you to do, Tucker? Start in the back. There's people back there. Uh, might be seeking their comfort level way back there, or they didn't get a good seat up front like you all did. <laughs> we don't want to chase anybody out of the room. Okay, so uh, hey, since he's going around with that, let me grab another rat snake. We're spending a lot of time with rat snakes. Now we're going to go through a, a number of other species of snakes. But our rat snakes are just so nice and big and relaxed. I like to take these out to just talk about general things about snakes. Okay, so these two are sisters. The one that Tucker's walking around with is our, uh, I think I mentioned our 12-year-old female. This is her big sister. Big only older. They're the same size. Uh, she is uh, 14 years old. Uh, we have a male and a female who are 15 years old. This is our second generation of rat snakes. And they are mating and laying eggs. Uh, and we have young, young rat snakes that are like, you know, uh, four years old and 
three years old and stuff uh, in our collection as well. And we did bring in a three-year-old that we might show you before the day is out. Okay, yes. How long will it live? These live roughly 15 to 20 years. So these, some of these big, big ones are, are getting up there in years now. This snake, by the way, everybody, has been touched and handled by several tens of thousands of people. Several tens of thousands of people in their lives. They've had hands all over them since they hatched out of an egg when they're only this big. This is the only life they know. So anybody who's like, well, well don't, don't upset that snake. It's, well, I told you about my four-year-old grandson. It's pretty much impossible to upset these snakes without physically hurting them. Uh, you have to actually physically hurt them for them to be upset. Okay, which is pretty cool. These are like, you know, like kid-proof snakes. <laughs> Toddler-proof snakes. Okay. Uh, so, just a couple of things about the rat snake. The largest snake in the state is one of the rarest snakes in the state. And sometimes somebody will say to me, why is it rare? And I'll say, because it's large. Uh, this breaks my heart as an educator and somebody who likes snakes and a lot of other wild things out there that are disappearing. Uh, I think it's really sad that just being large gets a snake killed in this world. And you know why? There's two big reasons. Two big reasons outside of anything else might be bringing them down. Uh, Roadkill is one. So when you're a little garter snake this big crossing a country road, a couple of tars go by and their tires might miss you. You're only this wide. Long. When you are a snake this long crossing the two-lane highway, if a car is coming, you're dead. You're a dead snake. Do snakes have bones? No. Yes. Yes, they do. Yes. You want to change your yes. 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 If you meet somebody who is afraid of snakes, I wasn't telling you this before. If you meet somebody who is afraid of snakes or say they don't like snakes, they hate snakes, whatever, as an educator, I'm going to tell that person, you need to learn more about snakes. Okay? Uh, I tell people that all the time, but very often, since somebody I meet is really afraid of snakes, I'll ask them some very basic questions about snakes and snake anatomy and stuff, and I'll say, for instance, I'll ask them if snakes have bones. They'll say no. It's a reptile. Reptiles are vertebrate animals, animals yeah. with a backbone. So many people who are afraid of snakes will say they don't have bones. If I ask, are snakes slimy? They will say yes. They are not slimy. <laughs> totally dry. Totally dry. Okay. When I think of something that's slimy and boneless and long and thin and doesn't have any legs, I don't think of snake. I think of worm. So I think there are a lot of people out there who don't have personal experience with snakes, who never learned about them, that to them, this is this big, huge, slimy, boneless, biting worm with big fangs that likes to bite other things. Not true. Big, slimy, boneless, <laughs> biting worm. Fangs, biting, venomous, bad worm. <laughs> bad worm. Bad, big, biting worm. Okay, uh, so the, uh, anyway, getting back to the rat snake itself. Forest dwelling tree climbing constrictor. Can you tell it on my arm that it's a constrictor? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you might tell if I pretend I'm a human tree, that it is a tree climbing constrictor. <laughs> it's climbing the Jimmy tree right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the rare Jimmy tree. Uh, so uh, when you are holding a rat snake, think of yourself in the rat snake's view as the human tree. And it's going to hold on to you. It realizes it's above ground. It's going to hold on to you like it would hold on to the limb of a tree. This thing's got a grip. I just dropped my arm. It's not falling. Okay, it's got me. Oh, the uh, wind just broke the branch. It's hanging down now. Oh. <laughs> so that's what happens. Now, what would happen here, since it's a constrictor, it's strong, what would happen here if you're holding it? We let people, hey, you want your hands free? You can just hold it around your shoulders like this. Will, the problem with be. that is, is it's crawling around. It gets a grip. It had a grip on my arm. Well, yeah. it's around your shoulders. It could be starting to get a grip on your neck. And when you're holding it, you can feel the muscle. And if this snake decides, okay, I'm going to go exploring, and it goes and goes this way, exploring this way, then it goes exploring that way, then it goes exploring that way, then it goes exploring this way, there's a tightening tourniquet on your neck going on. And this happens sometimes. I got one, yeah. 
loosen up here a little bit. <laughs> you know, and so this is going on, and all of a sudden you feel, well, blood pressure's going up in my face. You know, it's turning red. If I leave it get any redder, it's going to be turning purple. I better do something about this. All right, so when you feel that, you feel the tightening on your neck or whatever, you need to keep this in mind. It's a constrictor, it's a strong snake, but they constrict their prey. It's just strong and it's holding on to you, whether it's your arm or your neck, like it would be holding on to the branch of a tree. Unfortunately, it's your neck, you know, that it's happening. So basically what I'm telling is, you should not be scared just because the rat snake starts going around your neck like that and tightening. It doesn't know it's strangling you. And when you know that it doesn't know that it's strangling you, you tend to feel a little bit better about it. It's an accidental strangling. <laughs> if it's an accidental strangling, don't you feel better about it than if it was an intentional strangling? <laughs> okay. How can anybody be afraid of you? I'm not going to let anybody say bad things about you. I won't let them. She's a good girl. <laughs> All right, if I can get her off me now. Okay. Oh, did somebody have a question? Yeah, so this is a forest dwelling tree climbing constrictor, as we mentioned. And so, therefore, um, it goes after warm blooded, furry, feathery things. You can put that in there. Furry or feathery things in the woods in their nest content since it's a tree climber. So it's unfortunate for this snake. It's got your arm. It's got a you know, Tucker arm branch there. Good job, Tucker. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, I don't. I, there, I, I've got a thing as an educator about names that were assigned to things. There's so many things I'm like, nope, that shouldn't have been named that. Nope, that shouldn't have been named that. It actually makes people think wrong, think wrong things about the wild creature. Okay, so with black rat snake, I can picture sometime back in history, whatever, a couple of hundred years ago or something. Some area of forest this is a forest dwelling tree climbing constrictor. Some area of forest was cleared off for farmland, and this rat snake comes out of the forest and finds, whoa, good hunting in the barn. You know, they've got mice and rats in here with all the livestock and everything. And uh, the farmer goes out and sees this large snake going after the rats in the barn and calls it that black rat-eating snake. And it gets shortened to black rat snake. And here we are all saddled with black rat snake now. If you're going to name it for a, its color, black, good job. But what it eats in nature? From personal experience, we know a chipmunk is a perfect size prey item for an adult rat snake. Perfect. And so we live trap chipmunks along the outside walls of our country house all the time. Um, These chipmunks are turning the ground around the foundation of our house into Swiss cheese, dug, digging all these burrows around there. And they are so prolific. There are so many of them. Chipmunks have territories, and we will have two or three chipmunks at a time that we might see immediately around the house, hitting the bird feeders and stuff like that. And we will set a little cage, have a heart trap, you know, chipmunk size, about like that, along the outside wall of the house. And sometimes within five minutes, boom, there's a chipmunk in there. And if any visitors happen to be coming that day, I will ask them, do you want to watch one of our rat snakes constrict and eat this chipmunk? How many of you would like to see a rat snake constrict the nature? Okay. So one summer, chipmunks, like a lot of small mammals, most populations, metal voles, rabbits and stuff, small mammals go through population fluctuations. There's boom years and there's years where there are not so many of them. Several years ago, there was this boom year of chipmunks, and I will trap two or three from around the house and think I have them all. We never see more than two or three at a time. And a few days goes by and we don't see any chipmunks. And all of a sudden, a few days later, there's a few more chipmunks running around. We set the traps and catch them. A few more days go by and there's more chipmunks running around. So the woods that surround our house 
This is like a vacuum. When we remove the chipmunks <laughs> from the area around our house, it's like water that just fills in the void that's there and they just keep coming. So this one summer from May to the beginning of May to the end of September, I was checking them off on the calendar, how many chipmunks we caught, and it made it to 44 chipmunks just caught around the outside of our house from May to September. And by the way, they're nowhere close to extinct. They're still coming. <laughs> just, after a while, there were some weeks the rat snakes were stuffed. Just stuffed that. The rat snakes just like, no more. I can't handle it. <laughs> they only eat like maybe at the most two a week. One rat snake could only at the most eat two a week, and we were stuffing them all. And our next door neighbor got wind of it. Like, Next door neighbor was like, there are chipmunks all over the place this summer. And he's like, I'm trapping them and driving them, you know, three miles up the road and dropping them off. And I'm like, oh, you're turning the chipmunk into somebody else's problem. And I just happened to mention the rat snakes that we've got here. And the next thing I know, the next day, there's a cage outside of our door with a chipmunk in it. And so we've got him 44 chipmunks in. He probably gave us another 15 or 20 over the course of the summer. Wow, the summer of chipmunks. Yeah. What would give you a worse bite, a chipmunk or a rat snake? A chipmunk would give you a far worse bite than a rat snake. You might be on your way to the ready care or something for medical attention with a chipmunk bite, never with a rat snake bite. Now, I don't want to make you afraid of chipmunks. But as much you know, a chipmunk would give you a much more severe bite than Michigan's largest snake. Okay, yeah. Do they have to be alive? Like, can you freeze a chipmunk and then will the snake eat it? Like, we have done that before. Yeah. <laughs> There's only, the only problem is you have to, like, kill it. I, you know what? I'd rather not kill the chipmunks. I'd rather the rat snake does it instead. So there's that. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, hey, let's get off of the rat snakes. I want to show you. Um, I hope I remember what that is. Yeah. I want to show you our milk snake. Oh. All right, so of the three constrictors, the Michigan is uh, the, the eastern milk snake is the most common one. Here we go again with the name. People are like, huh, uh, Mr. Jim, how did the milk snake get its name? And I can only imagine it is some tall tales related to some tall tales from hundreds of years ago. So again, like the rat snake. I can picture some farmer who's scared to death of snakes going out to the straw right underneath, curled up right underneath Bessie's udders, and that spotty snake happened to be really bloated right in the middle, really wide. And since it's sitting there curled up under the cow's udders, the farmer came to the logical conclusion that this evil snake is sucking the cow dry overnight. It'll come out overnight and attach to the udders of the cow. And then the next morning, we only get half of the milk that we usually get from our cow. It's from that evil milk snake. Kill it! And so it's something silly like that. Maybe the farmer did see this snake coiled up, all bloated, that happened to be under the udders of the cow, but what did the snake just eat? Uh, yeah, it's a mouser. It just caught a mouse and ate a mouse, and it happened to be unfortunately underneath, but it pressed these udders, okay? And then farmers, uh, that means sharing that information with another farmer, hey, they suck milk from cows, and yeah, yeah. all the farmers in the neighborhood, all the farmers in the neighborhood are killing their milk snakes that are actually doing them on a service, you know, by keeping the mice under control. You know, so, uh, but anyway, I want to show you something. Is JT here yet? No? I, don't, he, I think he got distracted, maybe sidelined somewhere. Maybe uh, with, he's talking snakes with somebody else out there. So anyway, uh, this snake is a little bit different to handle. Oh, Julia, is she available? Julia was my sidekick last week. Oh, is he still doing that? Is Julia, is she, is she, Julia, she didn't mention this. She was my sidekick all through the fourth grade classrooms, and she was walking around with the snakes and everything. She was turning into the expert snake handler. Hey, everybody, let's just look at this for now. Do you see the snake? He has the spotty pattern. We get phone calls, emails, texts from more people thinking they have a rattlesnake in their garage, in their basement, in their pole barn. 
that ends up being a milk snake by far than any other snake. <laughs> In fact, I'm going to tell you nine out of ten times, I bet, at least, minimally, nine out of ten times when somebody contacts us saying that they have a rattlesnake, they think they have a rattlesnake, and they took a picture of it, it's this. So everybody should know that this snake commonly, commonly gets mistaken by people who don't know their snakes very well. Yeah, it's a rattlesnake. And here's one big reason. When a milk snake, large or small, is exposed, you pick something up in the garage and it's hiding under there. Because our mousers, remember, if you got mice in your garage, milk snakes might show up. Okay, they go where the mice go. And you lift that object up and the milk snake was hiding under there, an exposed milk snake with no place to hide, surprised and exposed, that tail starts vibrating randomly. We have five species of snakes in Michigan. When they are scared and exposed and no place to hide, it is, it's not like I'm going to fool their thinking. I'm going to fool this large mammal into thinking I'm a rattlesnake. This is just instinct with them. This is evolutionary instinct. When they're scared, the tail starts going, oh, I'm scared. Okay, but somebody sees that and then thinks rattlesnake and then they kill it. Okay, so look how wiry bodied a milk snake is. Massasauga, how stout-bodied it is. When uh, milk snakes lay eggs uh, early in the summer, the eggs hatch at the end of the summer, it's usually late August, early September, is when we get the most contacts from people. They find a newly hatched baby milk snake about seven inches long, same pattern as this, and they come across that thing, some batch of 10 eggs that's hidden in a wall somewhere in your garage or behind some shelving or something just hatched. And these little snakes are out all over the place. Last summer, my wife and I found seven baby snakes in and around our nature center that we built onto our house within a week. Wow. And we knew there's a batch of eggs that hatched and we're finding these one by one. Two of them were inside, five of them were right outside the outside walls, just crawling along the outside walls. So they're out there and every one of them, when you approach it, try to pick it up, there goes that little tail. And so we get a lot of, a lot of calls for those. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's a form of mimicry, right? Mm -hmm. Now here is a clincher you're looking at a milk snake. It has a fork shape in tan on the top of the head. Perfect timing. <laughs> Working up a sweat. <laughs> I was just pointing out to everybody about the fork sh tan shape mm -hmm. on the top of the head, and maybe uh, so JT is going to go around and show that to everybody. Hey, everybody, this is JT. Hi, everybody. Hi. He knows a lot about reptiles and amphibians. In fact, I'm almost ready to say more than me. I've been around a lot longer than he is. Um, yeah, so everybody can check out that fork shape. It looks like a nice V shape. Uh, they look like sometimes a, a U shape uh, on the top of the head. Sometimes it can look like a V with a stick on it. Nine out of ten milk snake has a fork shape, uh, fork shape in tan on the top of the head. I don't like that DNR poster. Because that fork shape is so fat, it almost looks like a triangle on the side. I see sometimes that fork kind of go like this. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm going to do my southern species. Okay. You know, it's highly variable. Highly, highly variable. And after a while, you see enough milk snakes, you can get a handle for that. Okay, I can see that being some version of a fork. There's one more version of a fork that is the toughest to pick out. There's a version of the fork called the broken fork. I call it a broken fork. So imagine the letter V on a dry erase board like this, and somebody goes and erases the bottom of the V. Now you just have two lines on its head like this. Or one arm gets almost completely erased. Now you have this like weird check mark on the top of its head. So you learn some of them that look broken or something. You still recognize that, yep, that's a milk snake. Uh, by the way, rat snakes will vibrate their tails when they're scared. The eastern and western fox snake will vibrate their tails. Milk snake, we said. For any of you who have experience with blue racers, blue racers are big tail vibrators. Anybody here seen racers vibrate their tails? Ooh, lots, lots of hands going up there. Okay, I have a beautiful video we took. We had a blue racer surrounded while following in the woods, and there were like six of us, and we managed to all come from different sides. The poor blue racer didn't know which direction to go. It was scared, it was surrounded. We all have our cameras out, of course. It was scared and surrounded, and it just pulls its head up like this, and it's looking back and forth at the large bodies moving towards it, and it don't, didn't know which direction to go. I kind of felt sorry for it, but great video. 
and that thing's tail is just going, it's up like this, it's looking at this person, it's looking at this person, it's turning looking at this person, up like this, and that tail underneath it is just going like crazy. So they do it. Occasionally, uh, remex snakes will also do it. Okay. Uh, none of the others really does it. Uh, now, uh, the next uh, snakes I would like to show you, everybody from here on out are all what we would call grab and hold on for the ride. They don't constrict, they don't envenomate the prey. The first two I'm going to show you, actually three of these, are things, boy, we sure hear people say a lot of negative things about them. And the Blue Racer is one of them. For how many people here uh, see Blue Racers around where you live or you know places to go where you see them quite regularly? I think just about all of you will know somebody who's really afraid of them if you aren't or say they hate them or something. I met a woman years ago who lived in a rural area between Ludington and Manistee. And I happened to be in a conversation with somebody at a restaurant about snakes because I was up there to do, uh, this is about 20 years ago, to do presentations on Michigan snakes. I believe it was uh, Audubon and Manistee. And I stopped in this restaurant and it happened to just be mentioning, you know, I'm here from out of town and what you're doing. And I started talking about all the snakes. And this woman hearing me pipes up. You don't have any of those blue racers, do you? And I am like, no, at the time I didn't. And she says, good, because if you had one, I'd kill it. And she pretty much just says that. And I am like, oh, why would you do that? And she says, I hate those snakes. If any blue racer shows up on my property, it's a dead snake. And I'm like, whoa, you need to learn about, more about racers. But there's a lot of people out there like that uh, who are going after them. We need education, that's all. Northern water snake? Not a water moccasin. I'm going to throw on you all the common mis misinformation thrown at people. If any of you meet somebody who's talking about water moccasins on a body of water in Michigan, correct that a northern water snake, harmless northern water snake. This is known to be a more defensive snake than others. Why? And when I'm telling you it's more defensive, I just mean if you go up to one of these that's swimming through the water and you grab it, it's going to come around and defend itself. You know, invite you. Skin wound? Yeah, just a skin wound. Okay, that's all not venomous. A water moccasin is a venomous snake that lives down in the southern U.S. and they're nowhere close to the machine or nowhere close. Okay, and so this, uh, if you see a snake swimming through the water, a dark snake, it might be banded or not. Big ones, uh, their, their pattern fades as they get bigger. Some individuals look like just a big dark snake going through the water. The females get up to four feet long. They have babies inside of them growing over the summer. Some of these females can get really big and girthy, and that might make them intimidated. They're just with baby snake. They're just with snake life. You know, they might have about 30 or 40 live babies growing inside of them, and all summer long, they are getting wider and wider. Yeah. What if it's a light colored snake? In the um, so, I don't know if any of you know her. There was a woman who was nervous about snakes who stopped by the exhibit who was a nature photographer and she had her big book of nature photography. Did anybody see her wandering around over there? She showed me a picture of a snake swimming through the water and she asked me, hey, uh, can you identify this? I asked a number of people who weren't sure. It was a hawk nose snake. But it's swimming through open water, and I told her that's really unusual for a hog nose snake. So just to let you know, all snakes are good at swimming across the top of the water. But most of them, if they don't have a reason for being out in the water, don't want to be there. They want to get onto land. I've scared garter snakes off of a shoreline just walking before, and the garter snake wants to get away from me, and it scoots out onto the water. It's swimming across the top of the water. But I watch that thing, and it makes a big arc pretty quickly, and it like it wants to get back to shore. I don't belong out here. And the hognose snake would be the same way. They're not fish eaters. This is a fish eater. And so you mentioned lighter snake, mm -hmm. lighter body. Very light. Oh, okay. I take some, I'll, I'll check out the <laughs> yeah. pictures. It's, it's Show not me that. very clear. Show me that later. It might be good enough to identify it at least. Yeah. So anyway, young water snakes are very contrasty in pattern. As they get bigger, the background color gets darker and darker, and they look less banded. 
come up as they grow. So the young ones are very contrasting looking in comparison. This is a fish eater. This is a minnow eater. They're just out there looking for minnows to eat. Hey everybody, if you're out swimming, uh, you're in the water in a beach area, there's a weedy area on the side of the beach. There might be a water snake diving underwater, swimming around, hunting minnows. And it might be chasing a fish here, chasing a fish there, and underwater, wandering into where the swimming area is, the beach area. Water snake has lungs. It needs to come up from air once in a while. And if you happen to be in the swimming area, waste high water, and all of a sudden, a snake head pokes up out of the water a couple of feet from where you're standing waist high in the water. You do not have to charge out of the water like Jaws is coming. It's not coming after you. It just came up for a breath of air. It did not know you were there. If you're holding still, a snake does not know you're there. Everybody needs to know that right now. If you're holding still, a snake doesn't look at you any differently than a stump sticking up in the environment. They act and react to movement, and they're going the other way. If you're moving around with a water snake <coughs> swimming in the water near you, and it sees you moving around, it's diving under or bearing away. It's getting out of your way. I've had people in boats tell me, like uh, fishing is a very sedentary activity. You're sitting there in a, in a boat just with your fishing line. And I've had many fishermen tell me a water snake is trying, or water moccasin sometimes, is trying to be aggressive snakes. We must have floated into its territory. It was coming after us, and it was following us. We are trying to get out of the way, and this snake just keeps coming. It just keeps coming at us, and when we stop, it's trying to get up into the boat. It's trying to come in after us. Water snakes, just like turtles, like to stop and rest. They don't want to keep treading water forever. And from down there on the water, this water snake is looking at the structure and it's like, I can rest there. I can get out of the water and rest and dry out and warm up there. And it doesn't recognize who you are in the boat. That's all. Water snakes are sitting up next to turtles on logs basking all the time. Sometimes people don't even notice that they're there because they're the color of the bark or something. So she's a good girl. I've had her since she uh, hatched out of an egg. I'm not hatched out of an egg. She's newborn. He's our live bear. And so she was only this big. They give birth to live young in late August or in September. You can find these little six inch long babies, you know, crawling in the shell of water. Uh, did you hold uh, the snakes at the exit? Do you want to walk around with this one? Okay. Did you hold this one at the exit? Just like this. You just hold it like this. And if anybody wants to touch or pet this, you're welcome to. She's been going up her sleeve. She has been. Maybe you'll see later. I want to see you. All right, so just open hands, let her move. This is not a constrictor, and you can feel it. It doesn't have the muscle. But she is going on 15 years old this summer. Sure, you can start from the back and work your way forward. Hey, everybody, well, well, I didn't get your name. What's your name? What is it? Mara. Mara? Okay, Mara's going to walk around with this one. And, hey, feel free, everybody, this female water snake, rub your finger or your thumb across the top of its body. If this is the length of the snake, go across like this. Water snake has the roughest texture of scales of any Michigan snake. It almost feels like sandpaper. And also out in the sunshine, the water snake is not glossy looking. When it dries in the sunshine, it looks like dry dirt. Except for smooth, shiny scales on the head. It's a good field mark, everybody. A field thing out in the sunshine when one water snake is dried out, the whole snake looks dusty, dry, with a shiny head, shiny, smooth scales on the head. The head always stays shiny, glossy. The rest of it looks dusty and dry. All right, let me show you this. This is an adult female. Say she's 15 years old. Next, she had a lot of hands on her for her life. Every one of the water snakes I have are, is uh, we've gotten when it was a little baby like that. They're just easy to work with. This one is not a baby. That's an adult male. So when you see these big water snakes swimming around back and forth, call them all females, this is your average size adult, maximum size adult male water snake. So when you see these big females going by, don't think that little skinny one is a baby. 
and one woman tell me and it was spring, which is mating time now, it's mating time for water sinks. The females are releasing a pheromone. And when the males smell this, and there's a female in close proximity, he will follow her everywhere she goes. It's that time of year. She's letting them know where the scent coming off of her. You know, she's ready to mate. In a female, this time of year, can have two or three or four or five males smiling after her. <laughs> in the water, you see one big female, and, and somebody looks at that and says, Oh, how cute! Here goes a mama snake and her babies. Got that one wrong. Uh, and then. Sure. Yeah, I got it. Move on here. We're going to go over again again. Of course. Okay, okay, okay. We're going to try to wrap this up in about 10 minutes because we've gone about an hour in right now. Thank you. I touched it. I want to show you. Just a minute. I'm just going to get this one out right now. This is the garter seat. Oh, yeah. Not Gardner. This is the most commonly seen state in the state. G A R T E R. I think more people mispronounce it. They stick an N in the middle of it to pronounce it correctly. A lot of people were having fun at the exhibit with this. <laughs> I have a handful of Easter gardeners here. Now here's something everybody needs to know. We have three species of garter snakes in Michigan. Eastern garter, Butler's garter. This one is called the Northern Ribbon Snake, but it doesn't have garter in its name, but look at the stripes, it's a garter. So, okay, so. The ribbon, do you see how slim this snake is? Mm -hmm. For its length, the ribbon snake is a naturally really slim bodied snake, so that's a good thing to look at. Uh, also, uh, the eastern garter, and all of these are eastern garters, is by far across the state the most common of the three garters. Now, JT, I wonder if you would agree with me on this, but I tell people it seems like everywhere I go in the state, Eastern garters outnumber either of those other garters 20 or 30 to 1. Would you say would that would be true? I think they're more adaptable than Yeah, oh. and so that's what I say about the Eastern garter. This thing can occupy any natural habitat across the state. Wet, dry, woods, open field. Yeah, if there's big enough lots for them. Sometimes a city that has too close of a crosshatch of streets, there's no way that it can survive because snakes and cars don't meet, right. mix. And I would say your average adult female garter snake probably needs a quarter acre to wander around. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have yards that big before you have a street and another street, and of course in the city there's going to be a lot of car traffic, even Michigan's most abundant, widespread, adaptable mm -hmm. snake can't make it. Okay, so this is the way a garter snake acts that is used to being around people. Females get bigger than males, and this might be fun for you. You see the color variation in here? Among the garters, they're highly variable in color. This is a male. Do you see it skinnier? The females have uh, stouter bodies than the males, and they get longer. The male has this thin little head and thin body. It's a full-grown male. Males are very active in the spring. They're wandering around smelling for females. So um, you want to quickly walk around with that? I will take that. You can all check those out. See if you can locate the male in there among the four heads. Okay, yeah. What kind of prey would the gar eastern garters snakes and the other garters Yeah, so the uh, garters, uh, Easterns will mostly worms and small amphibians, so think frogs, toads, worms. And you can find at least one of those in any natural habitat, if not all of them. Then the butler starter, which by the way, I'm not going to talk about any more than this. This one's only found on the eastern half of the lower peninsula. You can eliminate butler starter right away around here as a possibility. You see, but you see it's brown with the bright stripes on it, but it's a small snake. Our full-grown male butler's garter snake that we have in that bag is only this big. It's a full-grown male butler's garter, and we have a 
eight-month-old Eastern Garter that's exactly the same size as this full-grown adult male Butler's Garter already. So Easterns get a lot bigger. But the Butler's, it's so small. It's such, got such a tiny little head. If you throw a Nightcrawler to it, it knows it's food, but for a while, when he grabs it, it looks like the Nightcrawler's gonna win. <laughs> uh, so they have to go for small worms. Very small worms. I've gotten them to eat tiny frogs before, like spring peepers. It's got to be a really tiny frog for it to take it down. Think worms, though. Okay. And then um, we do have we do have a ribbon snake right here that just we did. We had a very old ribbon snake that just died over the winter time, and we don't see ribbon snakes like we used to around our neighborhood. And JT just found this one and knew that we were looking for one to add to our menagerie. So this one is either, could be a very young female, maybe a, you know, just a less than two years old, or it could be an adult male. The one that just died was an adult male. We had an adult female that had passed away for a long, after a long time with us the year before. And the adult male that we had that passed away was this size. Yeah. Just as big as a male ribbon snake gets. From where you're sitting, can you see that bright white chin that actually goes up onto its cheek? Your poster shows that very nicely, though. So the Eastern and the Vulcan starters both have yellowish chins. And I often tell people, if you're looking at a garter snake and you're seeing a, a chin and you're like, is that light enough yellow that I could call that white? That sure is getting close to white. This is white, white. This is snow white, and it goes up onto its chin. It's actually a little scales above its mouth. Go right there as well. Okay. This one does not eat worms. All this snake eats is small amphibians and small fish. And that's all the ribbon snake eats. Are you going to find this snake far from water? No. No. You know what I call this one? A wetland specialist garter snake. So the butler's garter over east, those are in our neighborhood. By the way, that snake is really plenty from what it used to be. I have a feeling turkeys have something to do with it. Turkeys. As turkeys have gone up across the landscape in Michigan, little butler's garter snakes have gone down. Turkeys treat any small snake like food. They're going for it. They're going to grab it and swallow it and it for sure. So I look at it. If the bigger garter snakes are surviving, maybe a big turkey might come up and peck in a big garter and maybe hurt the garter, but the garter is still mobile and it can get out of the way, get into the bushes, or get into the brush. If a turkey pecks at this little skinny butler's garter this big, one peck, it just maimed it. You know, that thing's not going anywhere, it's just going to get back or something. And so I can't help but wonder. I talked to other reptile and amphibian people in the state about this before who have told me they have independently thought about the same thing. I don't know if there's any research out there pointing to that. As the turkeys have gone up, same trajectory, opposite trajectory, the puppers are going down. Okay, um, we're getting low on time. The kids have been sitting here a long time. We're going to have a mingling time for maybe just 10 or 15 minutes after. But I think I'm just going to end it with to show you one more snake. We have a young blue racer that I would like to share with you. Okay, and um, TJT, did you pack the racer? I can learn that, but I can run and get it real quick. Okay, in fact, we don't want to make everybody wait. I'll get that. Do you remember what bag the hog nose was in? I think it's in with water snakes, which okay. I think is the blue bag. Hog nose snakes are, are being mis, uh, misunderstood by people out there, too. So the hog nose, oh, yeah, it's in here. It's in here. Okay. Here we have one that will be two years old at the end of the summer. Hognose snake is an egg layer. Some are live bear, some are egg layers. Here is one that's about a year and a half or a year and a half old. I can see it's getting a little bit foggy. It's going to be shedding its skin pretty soon. But these are toad eaters. They specialize in eating toads. They've been encountered and uh, found in every county in the Lower Peninsula. However, I have never seen one in the greater Lansing area. I don't think they are as prevalent in loamy soil areas. That's areas that have black dirt. 
and worms and stuff. Toads do really well in sandy soil habitats. Well, you have sandy soil habitat over on this side of the state. So northern Michigan counties and western Michigan counties are very sandy soil. And it seems like they have bigger populations of toads and bigger populations of the toad predator, hognose snakes. Okay. Now, for some of you who've experienced this before, a hognose snake, stealth bodied snake, it is the next stealth body snake to the Massasauga. And unfortunately, it's spotted. And people see that, and they think it's a rattlesnake or a dangerous snake, and they kill it because they flatten out when they are exposed, no place to hide. They flatten out, they can't get away from you very quickly. So, slowish moving snake, they flatten out, they rear up, they can hiss quite loudly. Raise your hand if you've seen this behavior. I cannot tell you how many pictures over the course of years I've seen on people's phones. They want me to identify this snake that they killed in their yard. And I have to identify a headless hognose snake picture. So many. I was at a presentation at a nature center in Cadillac. I'm not kidding. This man who does not come to the presentation, at the end of the presentation, he comes walking in with this big coffee can, back when there were coffee cans. And he says, I've got some snakes in here. I saw in the paper there's going to be this snake program, and I've got some snakes in here that I got out of my yard that I want you to identify for me. I am thinking, I'm hoping that container with some live snakes. And it was filled with killed hognose snakes. Big ones and little ones. And every one was a hognose snake. I'm going through their dead bodies. Hognose, 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 headless hognose, and so on. And I told the man, he should have gotten here earlier for the presentation and been in on the presentation. Uh, hey everybody, uh, they will also play dead if you bother them long enough, they'll roll over. I don't like to call it play dead because I think there's research now showing this. They pass out, they fail. <laughs> but you know what's weird about that is that when you see one, they always go belly up. So if one is harassed enough, your dog gets at it or whatever, it'll do this play dead thing, roll over, play possum, let's call it, and it rolls over belly up. And it very often will open their mouths and the tongue will be hanging out. And it looks dead. You would assume it's dead. It's laying there, looking like that, dead snake. But if you go up to that snake, it's upside down, and you flip it right side up, when it is playing dead, it will immediately roll back over. <laughs> <laughs> up. Right side up. Are you okay? Up, no, I'm no, pretty right sure I'm dead. No other Michigan snake has a elongated bar, dark bar on each side of its neck. You can see it on the one on the poster. The woman who showed me this hognose snake, I was surprised that what's this snake swimming in the water, expecting it to be a water snake. And I looked, it's like, oh, it's a hognose snake. It's snout is turned up a little bit. And you can see I pointed out the bar. There's the bar on its neck as it was swimming by. Really good field mark. Don't be afraid of hognose snakes, everybody. I don't care how big they are. They have no instinct to bite, zero instinct to bite. You can pick up a hognose snake and it will not bite, I guarantee you. It might go like this at you. Is this intimidated enough? You stick your hand down by it, it might jerk at you like this, but as you're yanking your hand away, it goes, oh, that mouth not open. It goes like this. Now, if you go up to a hognose and you scoop your hands underneath it, it's all flattened out there. It's as flat as a pancake. And you go underneath it, scoop your hands underneath it, and pick it up. They start to settle down in your hands quite quickly. This is very scary for a snake. I call it the pickup. If you're coming down on a snake like this, this is very scary for a snake. Get down low and scoop underneath the snake if you can. If you want to pick a snake up, get down low and try to scoop under the snake. Don't come at it like this. It's very intimidating for the snake. Okay? And if you can pick up all of those snakes, you have it in your hands and be holding it. Within five minutes, it's sitting in your hands kind of like this. However, be prepared for this. Because toad eaters, it is so upset and it just ate a toad. It may throw it up as you're picking it up. <laughs> Have digested toad, it might throw up on you. They all start pooping. This liquidy poop. So we do when you're picking it up. 
Try to do it with arms yeah, extended if you want to keep your clothes clean. Oh, I see. Yeah. Drip, drip, drip. Yeah. 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 Oh, I see. Yeah. Drip, drip, drip. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 My wife and I have never read this in a book. And I don't know if I talked with JT about this anymore. However, I want to see if he has experienced this. For anybody else, raise your hand if you picked up a hard nose cigarette. Okay. They, they all don't do this. But we have had this happen enough that we are like, this is one more thing in the arsenal of hard nose When you disturb one, it starts booming. Even when it's on the ground, it opens it up, and there's this liquid poop starting to come out of its back end. And as you're picking it up, or sometimes even approaching it, it can take its tail and go like this, like whip its tail towards you like this. And when it does this really quick whip like that, there's poop on its tail. And it flings its poop. And our, our nickname for it is not... Uh, is not a puff adder, it is poop slinger. <laughs> so it's one of those poop slingers, put on your goggles. So one time we picked one up when we're out with a camp of kids, and we go and pick this thing up, and I am holding it, and this girl comes up to pet it, and when she goes up to pet it, the thing, and the thing is dripping poop, the thing goes like this at her, and it's a hog nose about this big, it flicks its tail at her, everybody saw it in this line of liquid poop just shoots across her t-shirt like this. Look at that! Poop slinger. But it won't bite. What a cool snake, but it won't bite. The worst thing about most wild snakes is getting their body Yeah. Yeah, or musky. Yeah. Musky over as well. Hey, uh, would you like to handle some snakes for a while? We went long. I'm sorry for that. There's a lot of information. I often say this should be a class, not a quickie presentation. I have too much to share. You know, this should be like in a school, like a four or six week unit called Michigan Snakes. You'll have fourth graders growing up to, into adults all, all over Mason County who are not afraid of snakes and who would never kill one. Okay? So here's the way we do it, everybody. We're going to do this standing. Open hands. You always support the body and give the snake the freedom to move. Oh, everybody got that? This is a yes. This would be a no. Yes. Big no. Don't dangle it. Don't hold it back at all. Open hands like this. If you are holding a snake and somebody is standing next to you wanting to hold, waiting to hold the snake, let's try to move these snakes on. Just hold it for like 20 seconds and pass it on. Quick picture or whatever and pass it on. Everybody got that? We also do all do handling standing up. So you know what might help here too? Anybody who's sitting in a chair, we can push chairs to the side or those green ones are probably stacking chairs, right? We can make a lot of room in this room really quickly just by getting chairs out of the way or like stacking them. Once this one, 